I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. Nate's come out with another awesome tool for the swimming community. It's called Swim Nerd Live and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone or other device. It has all the information you're looking for, event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more. Okay. Jaco Vaharan, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, listen, where are you coming from today? I'm coming from Eindhoven, uh, where I where I live, you know, when I moved back from, or when we moved back, actually, from, from Australia. We went back to uh, my hometown, which is Eindhoven. Oh, excellent, excellent. And um, I've seen some reports lately of, of some, some activity with you, maybe with, with German swimming, and then... Uh, French swimming. So, what's the latest in kind of where you're headed? Yeah, I uh, I joined German swimming, but it was only for six months. It was, it was kind of a, a project I did with them. Uh, obviously, it was in the midst of all the COVID regulations, so uh, it was more uh, a, a Zoom commitment. So, uh, for for approximately two days a week, um, been chatting to a lot of their coaches, trying to uh, support them in creating the plans after the Olympics, so the 2021-2024 trajectory, and talking a lot about talent development, training. We did some clinics, we did some some tech technical clinics, uh, talking physiology, testing, all, all all the things you can think of as a as a coach. So that was actually quite enjoyable because it helped me through let's say sitting a lot at home as well awesome and then now and now with french swimming what's the update with where are you going with them yeah i've uh, i've started the first of september with french swimming uh and i'm there uh what you would like call team director um uh, into 2024 uh, at least i hope so and, uh, you know, trying to build their team. It's, it, it's a very similar role, I must say, to the one I had in, in Australia. Uh, so working with the coaches, um, um, together with them, the, developing their plans, but also the national team plans, the selection, the selection criteria, et cetera. So pretty much all the stuff that comes with, uh, with the head coach, but I'm not the head coach there, I'm a team director. Oh, interesting. Now, are you going to have to move the whole family there as well and set up in, in France? 
No, actually, France is is pretty close for me. Like uh, I'm I'm from Eindhoven here. You can fly to the south of France. So south of France for me means uh, the program in Nice, Marseille, uh, Antibes, and and Martigues. Those are the four key programs there, and that's a, only a one and a half hour flight for me. Uh, so that's where I was like two weeks ago, uh, because I've just started to visit the coaches and their programs. Mm -hmm. um, last week I was in Toulouse and I was in Foromeu. Foromeu is there, it's in the Pyrenees, it's their altitude uh, place. And uh, next week I'm going to the north of France. Uh, so that's Paris, that's Béthune, Amiens. And I can either go by train there, which is four hours, or drive. Uh, I will drive actually next week because I'm only three hours from Bethune. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm sure th they're excited about this possibility then. Have you been well received by, um, you know, the French swimming community? Yeah, fantastic. So far, so good. You know, I've, ju I've just started and <laughs> I uh, obviously tried to get a little bit of uh, control over the language too. Mm. I can understand a bit. Um, uh, speaking is difficult, like uh, it's definitely not my language, but um, I, I followed some course as well. So uh, just to make sure that I'm starting to understand more, but luckily a lot of the people spree speak English as well. So that's good for me. It always fascinates me, Europeans, how many different languages you guys can speak. I mean, I can't speak anything but this uh, stupid uh, English, Australian English that I have. I can understand some some Southern American English, <laughs> but that's about that's my language. But how many languages have you got down now? Uh, well, pretty much three, I must say. Like, like, uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, of course, Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, but almost nobody in the world speaks Dutch, so you have to learn different languages. Right. A bit of German, English, and now a bit of French too. Yeah, wow. that's awesome. Well, listen, um, I'll tell you something personally. For me, I I took something from you. I, I was obviously um, a competitor of Peter van and Hugenbaan back in the day, and um, you were his coach uh, from a from a young age. When did you? How old were you when you started coaching Peter? Um, when I started coaching Peter, it was ninety two, so I must have been twenty three actually. Wow. Like uh, yeah, we Peter and I pretty much grew up together really in the sport. Mm. So I, I started coaching here in Eindhoven when I was twenty three, and mm. three years before that, uh, I started coaching already when I was twenty. Um, uh, and, and those, uh, you know, just to put that in perspective, those weren't full-time jobs, you know, like the, the landscape in the Netherlands in, in coaching is very different to what you're used to, you know, in the U S or, or Australia, like, uh, most coaches in, in the Netherlands are volunteers. Mm. Uh, the only coaches that actually have like, yeah, more like a, a full-time job are the coaches uh, that work for the federation so that adds up to approximately 10 coaches at the moment i believe uh, and the rest is all volunteer so um, i i did that as well uh, when i started in the 90s um, and my first coaching job was in maastricht uh, then was asked to start coaching in eindhoven and that's where i met peter for the first time and he was 15 and I was 23. And from there on, we actually took on that journey. Wow, that's incredible. And I, like I, I was going to say, I took something from you as a young coach. Um, one of the things I always admired about you and Peter is um, you were regarded as a great coach. Peter was regarded as an incredible swimmer. But together, you were regarded as a great team. And that's what I always noticed from, from day one with, with Peter it was very difficult to race Peter on a good day, but it was it was even more difficult because he had a coach with him who was part of his team, always with him, always, um, you know, it, it seemed like it was very hard to break up you two. You know, it, it was, for me as a competitor, I always wanted to try and get in the mind of my competition or whatever, but you two seemed like an unbeatable force together. And I, and I admired that. It seemed like Peter got a lot of confidence from you. You took a lot of confidence from him. And, um, and, and as a young coach, when I started coaching, um, guys like uh, Cesar Cielo and, and Fred Bousquet, my intent was to be like you and Peter. I wanted to be a team. I wanted, when they got up on the block, I wanted them to feel like I was there with them. 
Um, when they had doubts and fears, I wanted them to feel like I was part of that and, and they could rely on me. And, and I absolutely got that from you and Peter. So I wanted you to know that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. You know, when, let's say, you know, when you're starting coaching in, in, in your 20s and early 20s for me, really, uh, and you start working with athletes, you know, I actually coached in the programs athletes that were older than I was. Uh, because I, I, I wasn't particularly a good swimmer, you know, I did enjoy a bit of training and racing and, and, and obviously didn't have the talent, but my dream was always to become a coach. Um, and so, so I went to, uh, sort of a sports academy in the Netherlands. It's called SEALS. Um, uh, it's not a university, but it's, a like sports education where in the first year you do all kinds of sports actually also the sports that you're absolutely not very good in like soccer and tennis and handball and uh i did judo and gymnastics and athletics so you get a very all-round broad education and also it comes with physiology psychology uh nutrition strength and conditioning so very broad in the first year then the second year um it uh, gets a bit of a, a more narrow focus so i started focusing definitely on swimming because that that was my dream and i was there for and uh besides that because i had to pick another one i did judo as well and strength and conditioning and then in the third year it's more like an internship you do mm -hmm. um and uh together with 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 the school and that's that's pretty much how i became uh, a coach but, but again, like if you're in your early 20s and you start to coach athletes, you're pretty much part of the swimming group, you know? Um, right. And I think the unique thing about, um, you know, my relationship with Peter, um, we, we're still great, you know, best mm -hmm. friends, um, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And I, I see him quite regularly and we still quite regularly even work together outside swimming. Uh, you know, doing some corporate presentations or, mm. or with, with, with any job he's doing at the moment. Um, but he always considered me, as soon as we came to the pool, I was the coach, he was the athlete. Mm. And outside of that, uh, we were just, and are just good, good great friends. Wow, that, that's uh, an interesting balance to try and get right for a young coach too, right? Like, because it's very easy to go one way or the other you want to be maybe too hard or too distant from the athlete or you want to be too friendly with the athlete and to, to strike that balance is difficult as a young coach did you find times where you had to try and figure that out for yourself yes absolutely you know like uh, I, I think when you when you're young you pretty much have to figure out everything for <laughs> yourself uh, so in my early years as a coach we were really pioneering uh, as i mentioned like uh, swimming in the Netherlands didn't have that incredible culture that I've seen in, for example, in Australia. So I didn't really have a mentor or, or great examples. Don't get me wrong. There were some good coaches in the Netherlands, but I didn't have those great professional examples. So you, you pretty much have to figure everything out your, yourself and it comes with ups and downs, obviously. Um, but you know, uh, the club here in Eindhoven really gave me that opportunity. And, and you know, I, I looked for mentors a little bit outside the sport who could help me uh, in, in developing mm. coaching, leadership. Uh, I, I, I think at that time, I didn't even know the meaning actually of that. You know, we were just, uh, I was, you know, creating swimming programs and plannings just on knowledge that I had from school and a little bit from my own career. Um, I think the good thing about that was because of my broad education in sport that I could bring in elements that I had from team sport, from mm -hmm. athletics, from my uh, strength conditioning background. Uh, so we created actually that program uh, ourselves um but it was quite a journey and as i said it comes with ups and downs you know it was not, not like an easy road in and and understanding everything that 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 we now call like high performance or elite coaching wow interesting journey um it sounds like you uh, uh kind of were, were learning as you were going in terms of <clears throat> the physiology and the, and the technical side the real scientific part of it 
Um, how did that come about for you? Because it seemed like you had a grasp of that at, at a very young age. Is that something you you physically studied from books and from professors, or is that something you learned as you went? Yeah, I, I think in a way my education at school, so at that sports academy, helped me helped me big time in 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 setting the platform and understanding physiology, biomechanics. Um, uh, you know, the, the, just just uh, some physics and 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 everything, but it was just the the, the basics really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think after that, you know, when you are actually going to become a coach, um, uh, when I did my internship, um, uh, that was in Maastricht, and it was with a coach called Ronald Castra. I don't know if you know him, but he was mm-hmm. in the '90s. He was the coach of Fred de Burghaven, uh, the guy who uh, Olympic champion, hundred mm-hmm. breaststroke in '96. Um, so uh, he taught me a great deal as well, actually about coaching and swimming. And he just gave me my own group. You know, I, I was doing an internship there. He said, like, come in, uh, because he did the same education as I da- did. And he said, like, it's great to have somebody again passionate for swimming come in here, you have your own group. And if you have any questions, ask me and, and I will tell you if I see something. So for me, mm. that was already, you know, an opportunity for, for, for development. But then I, I was really 20. Um, uh, so and then, yeah, I guess um, after that, I, I just started, you know, literally first with books that I still had with physiology lessons and just writing programs based on on physiology so not so much of of you know i didn't have earlier coach or swimming experience to that level so i just started writing those and i did that pretty much until 96 96 was the first olympics i went to that was together with peter as well actually Mm -hmm. He, he was uh in atlanta he was fourth in the 100 and fourth in the uh 200 very very ungrateful places you know uh, both, <laughs> yeah, <false>. both, <laughs> both on one tenth of a second oh. but as i mentioned already we were pioneering really mm-hmm. like if i look mm-hmm. back at it now i, I think sometimes what were we thinking <laughs> even? but with his talent you know he got to four places and i coached another girl uh, then her name is kirsten vlieghuis and I think most people won't remember her, but she got bronze in uh, uh, Atlanta in the four and eight hundred. So oh, for wow. me, as a coach, that was incredibly important because um, it showed actually that we could get to that level. You know, it wasn't gold mm-hmm. yet, but but for me, you know, as a young coach, I, I also think you know, like you need that confidence or or that. Um, yeah, a little bit that for, for yourself, that boost that you say, well, we, we can actually compete on the world level. And are again, you, are you was, making money at this stage? Are they, they're not still a volunteer then, are you? No, I, it was a halftime job at the moment. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, so I, I worked in the swimming pool at that mm-hmm. stage. Mm-hmm. And uh, the club here, PSV, uh, organized for me also a job in a, in a fitness center. So I I was part-time strength and conditioning coach. Uh, Well, not really strength conditioning uh, coach. You know, it was more like a health club style. Um, And and the other part of me was uh, being a swimming coach. And I I got my first full-time contract uh, after 96 uh, Olympics because obviously it it was a good Olympics for us. You know, we went... We went with eight people uh, of the club in Eindhoven to the Olympics in, in Atlanta. Mm. So for me, that was already like, wow, you know, uh, you know, you dream as a coach of, of maybe getting to, to the Olympics at some stage uh, and maybe being in a final. But to go with, with eight athletes to, to the Olympics and actually come away with two bronze medals as well. And too many fourth places, to be honest, because Peter, <laughs> Peter was fourth twice uh, i coached at that stage marcel wauda he was medley swimmer uh he was fourth in in mm. uh, 200 and 400 as well <laughs> but <laughs> at least you know I, I got the notion we can do this right. but we need to we need to become better and um then in 97 i was introduced to a physiologist uh named jan olbrecht mm. 
And he really um, became a mentor of me on the physiological side. So he does this right. testing through lactate. And, and uh, well, for now, I've al already been working with him for 25 years now. So I can almost dream what he has to tell and what he has to say. Mm. But it was great, you know, education. And, and it gave our training uh, just a little bit more, that extra on the scientific level. So, so mm. it's not that my training changed 100%. Um, but what it did for me was uh, I could better understand the impact of the program and the choices I made for the program on the athlete. So, you know, and that, that really shaped, let's say, our journey to the Sydney Olympics. Did you feel encouraged from other older coaches or did you feel pressure from them like them thinking who's this young kid th knows nothing you know taking over the best athletes uh, what was the feeling like for you in the netherlands at the time um no i i guess uh i definitely felt encouraged you know because at, at, at that time we, we had a strong program in the netherlands but it, it's not comparable to, for example, what I've now experienced with, with Australia or even Germany and now in France, mm. where you have a lot more professional coaches. So, um, uh, again, I, I, I didn't have these, these, these great examples. And on the international stage, um, I, definitely around 96, 97, 98, I was pretty much unknown. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it got better when in 99, Peter beat uh, Popov in the 100 at the European Championships. Mm -hmm. And that's really all also became the point, like, where we thought, like, yeah, we can do this. We can do this next year as well at the Olympics. Um, and I think recognition of other coaches and being respected or accepted by other coaches comes with with well, pretty much your athlete winning winning medals right right yeah absolutely there's no doubt about that tell me this um what made you what you know from where you've started to where you are now and the way that you're regarded now as you know one of the best in the world clearly uh how did you go from there to there in terms of just your personality your drive like if you were to you know, analyze yourself as a young coach and maybe help other young coaches pull out the best attributes of what got you to where you are. What, what would you say some of those things were? Uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now really like 30 years, 31 years in the sport. Right. And I, I think I can describe, I, you know, I said, uh, like I started in the 90s. And in the 90s, I was really a coach focused on the program so i try to gather as much as possible information from swimming from other sports from other coaches from from what i just saw in the world and what i was thinking myself um but it was very much focused on the technical details of the program i think a big shift for me came in 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 the next decade let's say between 2000 and 2010 obviously peter uh, became olympic champion uh, Inge de Bruyne uh, became Olympic champion, but she was she was coached by Paul Bergen, you know, so uh, she he literally made her career. Uh, but but uh, I, I learned a great deal from him as well, you know, just following his program from a distance mm -hmm. and, and thinking like, hey, this is something I, I can definitely use in my career as well. But I think in the next decade, I got more focused also on the personality of swimmers mm -hmm. uh so so it became more people management you know the program but also becoming more aware of actually what it means to work with an olympic champion because obviously your world but also the world of that athlete changes uh there's much more coming at you like more expectations more commercial interest more media pressure uh more distractions mm -hmm. uh you know peter and inga became like like famous people in the netherlands mm -hmm. and learning to deal with that as well um and i think um 
yeah, I, I just learned a great deal from all the people I started working with, you know, also the people around me. I, I already mentioned like Jan Olbrecht, we, we continued working with him, but uh, also uh, we got a, a strength conditioning coach, a nutritionist, physiotherapist, medical. So slowly but surely, I was uh, capable of coaching, but also building a very strong team of experts that I could work with and the athletes could work with mm -hmm. around us. And I think that that developed also more of my view in coaching. Um, and I learned a great deal from them. You know, I, I think as a coach, you learn from your athletes just through experience and going to meets and going through the training phases and everything, but also from everyone around the mm. program. I'm, mm. I'm always very open to trying to, well, at least listen to new ideas and then obviously make a decision. Well, I can use this or I can't use this. Um, so, uh, and then in the, yeah, actually the next decade. So, so let's say the, from from 2012 up until now mm -hmm. um i had to reinvent myself actually a little bit because after 2012 uh the olympics which i went to with uh ranomi chromo mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and marlene veltheis so that was was actually a very good olympics too for us uh but then i thought after the olympics i uh i want to stay in swimming but i yeah, after almost, I was still pretty young, but I started young. But after 23 years on pool deck, mm -hmm. I want to see if I'm capable of doing something else as well. So I became technical director in the Netherlands, but that lasted only a year because in that year I got a phone call from, from Australia if I was interested in that role, um, which was very interesting for me because up until that time, I, I'd just been a pool deck coach, really. So it really... Mm -hmm required a transition for me to understand actually what difference can you actually make as a head coach or mm. as a performance director or any mm. name it has mm. uh, because I, I believe you know as a coach your your role is very clear you're there every day you're creating the planning you're writing the programs you're working with the staff you're working with the athletes you go to competitions and and you have a pretty I would say structured life. But when you go to more of a leadership role, your role is not so clear. So you, you have to, or at least I had to, it's, it's obviously my journey. I had to learn, you know, what, what does it actually take to become a good head coach, to become a good performance director? Uh, but obviously, I didn't have a lot of time to get into that because in <laughs> in Australia, as you know, there's always expectations. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it was, you know, a good learning trajectory actually to be in 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 this position in uh, in Australia. And I think what 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 I really benefited from in Australia was the fact that with all the coaches in in 2015, we started a leadership course. Uh, done by the Melbourne Business School, mm. and not just me, but but together with fifteen other high level coaches, so pretty much all the coaches you 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 know and 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 saw at the Olympics went through that as well. Wow, we actually did that twice, and it brought us a lot in mm. terms of because you know it those those leadership courses you don't talk really about swimming, but you talk about life, you talk about how people view you, mm. uh, and that's really. For the first time where it really got to me like yeah you know this is this is a really different job than day-to-day -day coaching mm. um, and and but having lived that experience i think you know you learn pretty much every year and and it's like you're almost stacking up those experiences and then you can start passing it on so mm -hmm. at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying getting in touch with all the coaches now in France as well and being able to just discuss with them pretty much whatever comes along. You know, sometimes it's about the program, sometimes it's about technique, planning, working with science. Sometimes it's just about the coaching life and what it takes. Uh, so it's almost like the conversation we're having right now. 
like uh, only only then I listen more than I talk now. <laughs> well, I'm listening. I'm loving all this. I mean, there's so many questions coming up as you're talking. I'm like, I want to go there, and then you say something. Like, no, I want to go there. But, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I love this stuff. It's awesome. Um, you, you reminded me of uh, I just did an interview with uh, Rocco Mearing in uh, South Africa. Uh, yeah, I saw coach, that coach of Tatiana, and um, you know a lot of what you were just saying there in terms of like building a team around you, asking a lot of questions, growing with your athletes very similar it seems like the best coaches do that so there's no uh it's not a surprise that you're one of the best he's one of the best because you're doing very similar things and that's why i love sharing information like this because young coaches are always asking well how do i get better this is how you get better you put people around you you ask questions you grow you learn um so this is very good stuff i want to jump back real quick to to peter because obviously uh, i'm fascinated um, with his journey and your journey and, and the success you had. I mean, Peter is uh, highly regarded as, as possibly the greatest sprinter of all time in an era where there were many great sprinters, you know, uh, and, and you, you talked about the fact that he had to take on this, this giant um, Alexander Popov. So when did you first recognize that you had something special in Peter? Well, to be honest, uh, and um the first day I started coaching with him, so this was in 93 and he was only 15. Mm. And I came from an okay program in the south of the Netherlands and then went to, to uh, Eindhoven. And the first day or first week I started coaching him, I thought this guy can do amazing things in the water. Like, um, you know, uh, we just just an example do, do, doing an aerobic set you know and we're talking now almost 30 years ago but mm. uh doing an aerobic set it wasn't too hard let's say eight two hundreds on on 250 and just just cruising lactate one stuff but peter was the he had that thing in his mind that he always wanted to do something every day uh if even if it was only for a short moment so he actually asked me, he said, you know, can I just push and go in the last 200? I said, yeah, sure, whatever. And I remember that he pushed off and 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 just swam uh, a 152 or a 153. And I was like, oh, my goodness, th this guy can swim, right? Like, th this is something something wow. else. And, and so I think even more than in competition, uh, in training, you, you, you recognize what an athlete is really made of mm. and and it took actually for me quite a long time before he really really started to show what, what he was capable of you know mm. like uh coming forth in atlanta for example he, he i think he swam 48 yeah i'm not sure he was one tenth of the podium he mm -hmm. swam in 48 it was a personal best for him so he he, he did great but but very unsatisfactory of course mm. And we were really disappointed. Like we, we, you know, looking at what I saw in training, I, I thought you can go a lot better than this. Mm. No, he swam 49-1. He didn't swim 48. 49-1 it was. Right. And um, so we were really disappointed and said like, no, nah, nah, well, you know, it's a personal best. It was a national record. Uh, it was an Olympic final. So. Uh, it was our first Olympics, but nevertheless, we thought like what we've seen in training, we can do, do a lot better. And and actually, the first time that I really thought now he's showing what he can was in in '99. So it took six years mm. uh, at the European Championships. He won six or seven gold medals there, even in 50 fly and 100 free. You know, beating Popov and the 200 free. And that's really really where I thought this is really the breakthrough that we've been looking for for the last four or five years really wow 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 yeah that that is an incredible breakthrough especially um you know the year before the olympics in, in sydney yeah and um well well now that you've got to go to sydney and you've got to beat uh all the best sprinters and all the best middle distance swimmers so that the to me at that time maybe not now but maybe it maybe at that time uh there, there were I up still now i guess there's this there's, there's two different mentalities there's two different physiologies training methodologies for the 200 and the 50 and the 100 i mean i mean you've got to race ian thorpe in the 200 and then you've got to race 
all all the other greats in the hundred, Michael Clem, you know, Alex Popov, you know, Gary Hall Jr. So you've got these you've got these sprint giants, and then you've got kind of this middle distance giant. So how were you able to have success in both of those realms in Sydney? Yeah, I I really think this is where the training, let's say, philosophy that we we always had came in, like uh, developing aerobic qualities, mm. but without sacrificing speed. So so for me, you know, like technique has always been uh, the number one priority. So I think the best swimmers in the world are technically the best the best ones too. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Peter didn't have great skills, uh, and that's an understatement. He had a very poor start and very poor turn. So we tried to do pretty much everything to improve that. But but it was <laughs> he had an incredible talent for swimming, but not for starts and turns. <laughs> uh, you know, like we we even in the lead up um, to to uh, two thousand, we flew in a guy from Auburn. Maybe you know him, Dean Hutchinson. Mm, Dean, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So we, we you know, th- this was the time where people started to do the track start, right? And we didn't know anything about track start. You know, we were just a two footed, and and so we we thought, you know, we better fly someone in from from the US <laughs> to tell us what this track start is actually about. And and uh, so he came in and he helped us big time, really really good. But still, for Peter, um, you know, to to pull off a great start, I, I think his first fifteen was five eight at best. So, um, you know, if you look at the, the big guns now, they do 5-0, 5-1, 5-2. So that's 0.6 already there. Um, and then his, his turns and underwaters weren't great either, uh, either. So, but we had to deal with that. And we always said, like, uh, listen, uh, it's, it's, we're going to focus on your strength, which is obviously swimming, um, which is obviously also... Um, uh, the capability of creating a good endurance so we always paid a lot of t- spend a lot of time in the aerobic stuff too but as long as you don't make the aerobic stuff too hard it doesn't kill your speed and it actually assists the development for you know uh, your back end 200 100 and even a 50 because in 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 sydney you know he he medaled uh, obviously won the 100 200 but he also uh Got a bronze medal in the in the fifty, I think uh, Irvin and uh, who was the other one tied yeah, there. Gary Hall tied, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, uh, so he could cover quite a range uh, in 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 terms of distance. Um, so, uh, you know, going from sprint to to two hundred as well. We did find out, you know, because um, from that moment on, we said like. We still want to go a little bit faster on on the 200 as well, as well as the 100. So the focus became less on the 50, more on 100 and 200. And as soon as we got down to the 144 level, 144.8 it was for Peter, um, I saw that, you know, that's the point where we had to sacrifice speed in the 50. So mm. I think there is a balance to, to how far you can go in combining 50, 100 and 200. Uh, I think in, in, in Sydney, he just hit the sweet spot, but to become better and, and still be able to compete with like Ian Thorpe, Michael Phelps, you know, he was coming up 2004 mm. as well in a 200. <laughs> we had to do more to, towards that regard and it became less in the 50. Yeah, I was felt like it was very selfish of him to be great at the 50 and the 200 you know it was like a, it used to upset me so much that this guy could swim a crazy fast 200 and then come down and and beat most of the guys in the world in the 50 but it, even with a terrible start and all those other yeah things. yeah but we, we we really our focus has always been the 100 so right. so we were training for the 100 oh interesting so to be honest uh the 200 was a surprise win in in um in sydney mm. um we, we know you know you know when you can see coming like he's pretty good at it but to be able to beat in there was was uh was at least a surprise to me uh and uh but let's say 
despite the heroic work we did, the whole training program has always been built around trying to get as fast as we can on the 100. Well, you obviously were very successful with that, you know, um, and, and Peter was incredible at the 100. In, in terms of Sydney, was was 47 a surprise at that stage? Nobody had done that, and I, I, it kind of shocked everybody when they first saw that time come up on the board. I mean, anytime you break a barrier uh, yeah. like that, you know, it, it, had you guys talked about 47 before Sydney? Yeah, yeah. That, that was actually really the goal. So we went to Sydney. We weren't talking about gold medals or winning. Obviously, that's always in the back of your mind and certainly was in the back of his mind. But, but I really wanted to, to stay focused on the process. So we, we kept talking about um, breaking 48. That was really the goal. That's why we, we, you know, we said, like, we want to compete in Sydney. And we want to break 48 and hopefully be the first one to do that. Mm. Um, and when that happened uh, in the semifinal, it was, that was actually mission accomplished for us. Mm. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it was, it was shocking to see it, but it was just incredible. I, I love seeing people break barriers, you know, for sure. So that was incredible. But uh, I mean, obviously he was great. Technically he was, he was good with the, with the physiology he could handle work. Um, but there is also a psychological component with a champion. Well, what do you think separated Peter when it came to psychological performance? I, I really think the, the, the real champions, they, they do have that, mental capability that as a coach you can facilitate so so you can actually empower it to grow but it is somewhat a natural gift you know because mm. four years later um again we we you know uh, wanted to succeed again in the 100 and 200 by then but but by then you know ian thorpe uh became was a lot better athlete particularly in the 200 mm. Uh, but our goal was again the, the 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 hundred and to win it. And at that point in time, Ronald Schumann was incredibly fast. Mm. Like I think uh, Peter at the start had a body length behind. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was really to stay focused on that process and not overswim the first twenty five. So really, you know, we we already said to each other like this is going to be a race. It's going to be, you know, it's going to come down to the last fifteen meters. And actually, it came down to the last stroke <laughs> to yeah. win it. Mm. But um, uh, what was your question, actually? <laughs> oh, just in, just in terms of the psychology of Peter. You oh, know? yeah. So, so in that race, uh, because that was really a difficult Olympics for him. You know, you're the defending champion. Right. And to race as a defending champion is, I think, is more difficult than to become Olympic champion. Becoming an Olympic champion is already a challenge. But why? Just the pressure that's on you? Yeah, the pressure that's on on it, and and also, you know, it, into Sydney we could fly a little bit under the radar mm. because even you know though he beat Popov uh, a year out in 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 '99 at Europeans, even though he was clearly coming up we were still under the radar. So, so as a coach, you know, that's a dream. You can just train and coach and, and, and the, the athletes takes a recovery, not too many distractions, uh, not, not anything. But after an Olympic title, that, that life changes. Mm. And we, we clearly had to ba balance, you know, like um, commercial interests, for example, and, and attention and, and doing an advertisement here and a commercial there and a photo shoot there with staying focused on, on, on the training process as well. Um, on top of that, he, he got a pretty serious back injury. So a year later, a year after the Olympics, or a few months actually after the Olympics, it was inevitable. He had to do surgery on his back. He had a herniated disc. Mm. Um, so he pretty much swam there with a herniated disc. And, and his start wasn't great already, but that made it actually worse. So that he pulled off that 100 win despite being a body length behind at, at the start and still a half uh, one at the turn again as well. Uh, to me, 
was more mentally than it was physiology really wow, wow. like um yeah and a lot of the great swims i think are won even before the race maybe there was a time during the day or in warm-up or right before he walked out where you felt like you felt pretty confident uh did you have that moment in in sydney and in athens before the hundreds did you have this moment where you're like he's gonna win this Yes, in Sydney, 100%, uh, because he was top, top, top peak shape. Every, everything, uh, every stroke was, was, was on the, the, everything was on the spot. Right. So we knew there he's going to do something special. Obviously, nobody can ever predict a gold medal because, you know, you're racing. It's, it's, it's all in the race. But we, we really knew we have it here. Uh, 2004, uh, because he really kind of struggled in the heats and the semifinals, and it really came down to the finals. So we never lost, and definitely he never lost confidence uh, because phys- physically he was in top shape. Like you know, everything we could measure and and could do to to bring him into top shape, but just his body uh, and his back uh, gave up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then to make it worse, uh, we were at that point in time, we were sponsored by Nike. And I don't know if you remember it, but Nike had the Swift project. Right. So they wanted the fastest 100 men in swimming and in running, which in the end, I think they had. Um, uh, but uh, the Nike swimsuits really weren't good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, he, <laughs> so he, before the race, he put on his, his, his swimming talks, you know, his, the, the jammer. Mm-hmm. And after a struggle, he had it on because his back was hurting and everything. And it was bloody hot there in, 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 uh, in Athens as well. Yeah. And I, I, and I was standing there as a coach and I was getting a little bit impatient. I thought, well, this race, you know, it's not too long anymore. But he stayed incredibly calm. But then he uh, wanted to... Uh, uh, tied the knot and he ripped the suit apart <laughs> oh, wow. so he had to start the whole process again mm. and that's even where i got nervous and thought like shit that you know <laughs> uh, it, it, anything in the lead up to this final is actually been quite terrible <laughs> yeah but then you know to get away and i think uh, you know if you look back at the race and you see him winning but the the celebration afterwards mm. i never seen that from him before like that right and it was actually i think just everything coming together there for him and despite a few struggles and a few ups and downs and everything that he nailed that one um yeah that caused his celebration probably that's probably one that he remembers more than because of this the struggle of absolutely one. Yeah. absolutely yeah wow. yeah yeah that, I, I think You know, uh, some people think like, well, when you're Olympic champion, you can ease off a little bit and you can back off. But if you have the aspiration uh, or the ambition to go even further than that, um, you're sure to not have a very easy road ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing those stories. There's there's so much to talk about with you. I want to um, get on to Renomi a little bit. Uh, Yeah. You, you have incredible success with her. When, when did that process start with you? Because I'm fascinated in this in terms of having a, a male Olympic champion and then going on and having a, a female Olympic champion in the same event. Uh, did you, uh, were there differences for you, surely? Uh, and, and kind of how did that process go for you? Yeah, well, th- I think the first big difference was that I went from... Uh, a champion in the hundred with the worst uh, start uh, in the whole field mm. to a champion in the hundred with the best start and turns <laughs> and on the waters of the whole field. So that was actually, uh, honestly, uh, Ranomi benefited from all the knowledge we gathered in the years before sure. to try and get Peter a better start and turn. Oh, so, okay. so he benefited a little from it. Mm-hmm. But also in Eindhoven, Eindhoven is quite a tech-driven area. This mm-hmm. is the, the city of Philips. You know Philips, right, the yep. electronic company. So, so pretty much Philips built this whole thing here. Uh, okay. And uh, by then, you know, a new pool was built with new high-tech cameras and everything we could use. And, and, and 
this came really into place in the work with Ranomi as well. So we, we could honestly teach her, uh, and of course she has a talent for that, but we could teach her how to start at your very best. And that was a three, four year project to, to, uh, to nail it like that. But it was massively helped again by the experience, but also by the technology by then we had in, in Eindhoven in the pool. Um, so uh, I started working with uh, Ranomi uh, in 2007, a little bit, uh, yeah. because she was, um, she was training in the north of the Netherlands uh, with quite a small team and, and, and she didn't train a lot. So she, yeah, but probably five, six times a week mm. uh, and not a lot of volume. You know, the first time um, uh, she went on training camp with us was in Cyprus and she said, can I join your group You're just to, uh, to train a little bit? And I, I already thought and I've spoken to her coach and she told me like, Renomi can cannot handle too much. I thought, okay, that's a, you know, good, good to know. Mm. So I took it very easy. I said, like, we're going to go six 100s on 130. And she looked at me and she said, I can't do that. So what do you mean? <laughs> 130? I, I said, there's no goal time. Just make the 130. That's all. <laughs> and she said, no, because after I swam uh, two or three 100s uh, freestyle, I have to do a little bit of backstroke because otherwise I cannot maintain She's like, me. She's, like, she's like me. She's like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. So, but um, uh, the good thing was, because it, it, this sounds like I'm ridiculing, but I'm not. No. It, it just a story about how trainable some of these athletes are, you know, at, at the peak of her career. Uh, so that was clearly 2011, 2012. She could easily swim like two and a half, three three and a half K sets in freestyle um, uh, to, uh, to do that. So in, mm. in all those years, you know, we, we not only, let's say, built the skills and the technique and everything, uh, but also really worked on, on, on that aerobic development. Right. Um, and um, yeah, she actually, I think her first Olympics, she was qualified for the 200. Uh, surprisingly enough, 2008, and she was a relay swimmer. Mm. So she qualified for the 200, 158, not too too quick, but but uh, it already showed actually with not too much, let's say, training volume at a young age that her capabilities were way more. Mm. Uh, and we actually spoke during the trajectory because after 20, uh, 2008, she came training full time in, in Eindhoven. And that's where I thought like, well, she's actually a much better 50 and 100 swimmer, uh, but we still have to develop her physiology. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I really feel like with, with Renomi leading into to 2012, we pretty much had a lot on the control. And I, let's say if I compare that with my first journey um, with, with Peter, I could use a lot of the experience I had there in that trajectory. Right, right. Now, you said she was at her peak in, in 11 and 12, but then you make a decision to kind of back away from coaching after that. Was that, was that a factor of burnout for you or you just wanted a new challenge? It's, it's, it's very, I mean, it takes a lot for a coach like you to give up an, an Olympic champion, kind of walk away from that. Was that difficult for you? Wow, yes. It's probably probably one of the most difficult conversations mm. I've ever had with an athlete mm. because, you know, she was at the height of her career, right. winning 50 and 100 in, 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 in London. And But I just felt, and this is what I explained to her, I said, Ranomi, I would love to keep coaching because I'm, I'm passionate for coaching, but I do feel I cannot give you the same energy and commitment really, which is what coaching is, as I did over the last four years. Mm. And, and uh, I said, it would not be fair for me to say, well, I'm going to do this, uh, but now I'm going to do it on 80% of what we know or of, or of what I can do or still mm. deliver. Um, and actually, you know, she's a great champion. She's a great personality too. Love, loved working with her um, and, and, 
you know, we're still in touch sometimes. And she, she, she's just a great person. And she, she actually looked at me. She said, I understand. Like, you know, like, uh, uh, because you're expecting 100% from me. So I need to expect 100% from you because that is the type of relationship you have with your athletes. And it's actually just being honest that you think you cannot do that. And if there's any doubt in an Olympic trajectory, I think you should simply, uh, yeah. Uh, for, for me, as a, as a coach, I didn't have another option than to say, I cannot, you know, I, I want something else uh, mm -hmm. at this stage of my career. Mm. And, uh, but it was, I, I can tell you, it was a, it was a, a very difficult conversation. Sure. <laughs> The good thing was we were, uh, because it was after uh, 2012 and we were invited for some gig in, in Curaçao, which is in the Antilla. Uh, that, that's a former uh, Dutch colony. And we were invited to do so. We were actually walking on the beach there and I said, well, Renome, you got to tell you something. So that's oh. that softened it a little bit, <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't easy at all. No, no, but he, no. I, I think credits to her how she managed that and and actually how she still, you know, in her career, because after 2012, she still did some pretty amazing things in her career. Who went on to coach her after you? Uh, directly after me was a young coach, um, uh, we, who you probably don't know, but, but I think a year after that, it was Marcel. Wow. Yeah, Marcel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did you take the approach then of kind of releasing completely? Because it's, it's difficult when you have that type of relationship, you take someone to that height, you want to stay involved, but then also you want them to grow and learn and be able to connect with somebody else as well. So what was your approach then? um actually completely letting go right and uh I, because i think it is uh unfair to the next coach mm -hmm, sure. to uh stay involved in the background right and and to give asked or unasked advice you know uh you know obviously um marcel had trained with me in the 90s up until right. 2000 renomi had trained with me so uh, of course, Marcel is his own coach with his own ideas. He's definitely not a copy of, of the program I did. Uh, but I'm sure there were some elements uh, in it. And, and definitely the, the skill work we did still in, in Eindhoven. So, But I think you can only empower a coach if you are willing to provide advice or have a conversation or share what, what, whatever it is you think. But as soon as you leave the program, you you got to let them go. It, it, it's actually what I'm doing in my job, what I did in Australia as well, what I'm doing now uh, mm. in, in France as well. You know, you you listen to coaches, you mm. share what you know. But I always I, I always tell the coaches, I said, listen, I I'm I'm offering you my opinion, but don't really don't feel like you have to take all these things on board because I, I think it's much more important that coaches define their own philosophy as to what they believe in it's right. not a, a a mini copy of mine or anyone else's program actually actually interesting that you just say that because i was, I was about to transition into something i uh, i took a photo while you were speaking and i sent it to dean boxel and <laughs> dean, dean uh dean actually just responded to me and he said uh one of my favorite humans um, oh, fantastic. Well, Dean is one of my favorite humans. Uh, he, he's, he's brilliant, isn't he? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in terms of the, the philosophy of the program, like you said, I think Dean, Dean was probably going through uh, a period of time where uh, some people were doubting what he was doing. And in, in his podcast, he directly referenced you and the support that you gave him and the back, the backing that you gave him, which I think was so crucial. Um, so in terms of uh, Australia's success, you came in at a, at a time where they needed you. I mean, they, they were in all sorts of trouble. Um, but then you walked away right before a time where you kind of saw the fruits of that success. You know, they, they had this incredible uh, Olympics a few months ago. And, and there's no doubt that your handprint was all over that. Uh, and especially with a guy like Dean Boxer, who credits you. So was it difficult for you to, to, to see that? Well, actually... It let's say the decision to leave before an Olympics is always difficult. Uh, but at that point in time, uh, I think 
um, I, I realized as a leader of a program that I think the best leadership you can provide is make, make the program so that the people don't rely on you being there. And that's actually, uh, you know, Rowan Taylor, who did an amazing mm -hmm. job there uh, with the team, mm -hmm. um, that you, you know you can go and the program will continue. Right. And I think, you know, I, I definitely couldn't have told you a story like this maybe even five, 10 years ago, definitely not five years ago, probably not either. Mm. But I think this is what ultimately leadership is about. It's not about you. Uh, so it's not about me. Uh, I'm not winning medals there. Uh, you know, you're, you're hoping to support people and, and, and be a mentor or, you know, somebody they can learn something of or some just a sounding board uh, sometimes, obviously. Uh, that to me, uh, I felt actually pretty comfortable, o although I, you know, difficult decision because right. Uh, you're right. You know, I have actually moved to Australia to be in Tokyo. Mm. That, that was the goal. You right. know, it wasn't Rio. Of course, we wanted to be better there, but it was Tokyo. That mm. was always like uh, the, the pinnacle. That's where we want to be good and, and challenge other countries as well. So to walk away from that uh, was difficult, but to leave it in the very capable hands of Rowan mm -hmm. and all the other people within Swimming Australia wasn't actually difficult at all because I, I knew for sure that they were going to do a good job and maybe even better than with me. You know, like Rowan hmm. is a, um, a real Australian, a proud Australian, uh very empathic more more than i am i think uh who was really the man to finish the job there that that that, that was my feeling mm. when i left i thought like we've come so far obviously things have changed to a positive which i thought like th this is fantastic but there's not much more i can add here and to then leave it in, in again, in very capable hands uh, with these great coaches. Um, no, so, so that was actually the easy part of the decision. Tell me this then. What, what do you feel you did add? What, what did they need at the time that you felt like you came in and, and, and did a good job with? Uh, and do you feel like uh, Australian swimming is a world leader right now? Yeah, I think, uh, I think they are. Uh, because um, what, what I first saw when I came in is uh, it, it actually a few things surprised me. Uh, I thought the level of uh, coaches working with scientists was higher hmm. than, I, um, than I actually found out it was. There were a few programs pioneering a little bit. And I think that level is much higher. That doesn't mean that every, every program in... in uh, in Australia is dictated by science. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, there's a much better cooperation between, let's say, the coaches and the physiologists they have and the biomechanists and the nutritionists. And the, the, so they have, I think, first of all, the coaches have better teams around them. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think their planning is better. Uh, I was actually surprised in this, um, and this is nothing negative, but, but I think it's just an evolution. But... Mm -hmm. The funding in Australia when I came in was you had to make a team. You, you probably still remember this from your yeah, time. Yeah. You had to make a team, which was usually done at trials in April. Mm -hmm. And then you got funding uh, for the next four months to prepare for the major event. If you made the team. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting, uh, that was in 2014 when people qualified for, uh, that was Commonwealth Games and Pampax. Mm. And... And I was only four months in the job there. So that, that, that is really the time where you're just figuring out what, 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 what is actually happening here. And people started thinking about, oh, I actually want to go to training camp here and I want to do this. And I said, is this not something you had thought of already or before? And, um, but I said, yeah, we can think of it. But if my athlete doesn't make this or doesn't make that, I cannot plan ahead. 
Mm. So um, uh, we we definitely so we we changed the funding structure so coaches and athletes can act, uh, actually plan longer term, mm. uh, which I think is critical if you want to be successful to have uh, more longer term goals, but also possibilities. But but of course you cannot if you're in doubt. Uh, do I actually have money to do this? Um, so. Yeah, you know, the, you can better ask other ones what, what, what I could possibly add, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we changed a few things structurally. Uh, shifted trials, obviously. I, I think it's a major uh, thing as well in, in, in the whole thing. You still have to do things right. Um, I think the team culture has really changed um, into uh, a very coherent group um, and not just a Korean group, but people who respect each other's differences as well. So it's, it's yeah. still, you know, there's unity, but still um, a possibility for, for people to work highly individualized as well. Um, so you see, I saw a, a great, you know, team. Uh, yeah, team is the word, I mm -hmm. think, for, for, for all of this. Yeah, they, they definitely came together. I saw uh, clear differences between some, some things I was seeing, you know, around after the time I left, there was, there was some shifts uh, and it wasn't going in a good way. And then when you came in, I saw shifts back to kind of how things were flowing in the past. And that's not to say that, you know, you, you went back to the past. It's just that you brought people together again and, and people were really fighting and believing for a common cause. I think that's such a huge part of leadership. So credit you to that. Fantastic. Uh, well, just give me a Dean Boxall story then. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've got a couple. Um, give me something uh, where well, you can remember. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as good as Dean himself to uh, to uh, to share these uh, to share these stories. But you know, work, working with Dean. Uh, no, I, I'll keep it because you know, well. Uh, Obviously, I love Dean, but there's more coaches I love there in Australia. Like, right, uh, right. I think this is one of the key things that, uh, although all the coaches work differently, we came together over the years more and more, and people uh, really, really willing to share. Uh, I think Dean told you the story about Japan, right? With the introduction. Um, he 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 said something about japan yeah what was that all about yeah 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 that was uh that's probably my my personal best story with the uh, with, with dean where i introduced him so in japan everything is very formal and when you go on a mm. training camp there uh what they really want is you sharing with their coaches you know technical insights and 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 all the like all right right uh and and you know and it goes very formal it goes with a with a lunch and you sit you know across from each other and and for me in my position i had to introduce the coaches from australia to them uh in which i introduced you know michael ball olympic champion coach of uh, stephanie mm -hmm. rice back mm -hmm. then uh Here's Peter Bishop, Olympic champion, Carl Chalmers. Here is Craig, uh, Craig Jackson, Olympic champion, uh, Mac Horton. And then, you know, very expecting, uh, Dean stands up and says like, uh, or, or very, you, you know, you can actually see him. What, what is he going to say about me? I said, he, he is Dean Boxel and he's actually done nothing yet. <laughs> so, but the good thing is, you know, Dean is incredibly competitive. Mm -hmm. So he actually thrives on that. I, I think with anyone else, I would have been a bit more careful. Mm -hmm. But I do know that he he likes, you know, those those type of challenges, which makes him a which makes him a great coach too. Mm -hmm. Um and and yeah, well, th th there's there's many stories with Dean Boxall, but but to be honest, also with the other coaches, I, I think um, that yeah, I, I, you know, for me, it's it's very difficult to describe, um, but I'm very grateful to have been just part of this amazing group of coaches and people that the Dolphins and the Australian team is, and not just in Tokyo because. You know, we, we met you when we were training in Auburn for, for mm -hmm. Rio. Yeah. 
I, I think at that point in time as well, the group actually was, was pretty good. Not as good as what they are now, but the people themselves and the Australians and, and the pride they have in their swim team and everything, I, I think that is something probably any nation uh, can learn something from. Yeah, you're right. I, I agree with you in, in Rio too. I met I met you guys. You came in and did the training camp at Auburn and, and we spent a couple of uh, you know weeks together. And um, the vibe I got was very good too. I mean, I, I felt like they had talent. They had um, great coaching. They had a great team atmosphere. But there was some comparisons between Rio and, and Tokyo that it seemed like there was a little bit of failure in Rio, but then they had success in Tokyo. So were you surprised by the failure or the success of either one? Um, I think for Rio, honestly, we weren't as good prepared. Let's say the, 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 the bigger changes in the program, shifting trials, but also what I spoke about, the individual funding trajectory, so mm. that, that allowed for longer term planning. Um, uh, pretty much all the things we, we did with the coaches and, and, and the group together as well. The return of the event camps, for example, mm -hmm. that all happened after Rio uh, because I honestly didn't feel comfortable to, I came in approximately two, two and a half years before Rio. And then you actually, you come into uh, a system and my decision was to run with the system as it was, of course, work on some key elements already and particularly working on, on the team and the group and, and, and being together. But not these big shifts that we made actually after Rio. Uh, I, I felt before Rio, the team wasn't ready for that. I probably wasn't ready for that either. You know what I said, like it was a transition for me uh, uh, as mm -hmm. well. I think I was much better in my position and, and in our, what I was myself capable of in the second uh, half of my term in Australia. So I think everything simply had to evolve mm. as well as the team, as well as the preparation of the coaches. Uh, I feel in Rio, we weren't prepared enough. Right. That, that is to say, not everybody. Do you get a similar feeling in terms of when you walked into Australia, uh, in, where you are now into in walking into France, or are they are they in a similar position, or are they further ahead than where Australia was? Do you think? Um, no, I I think they're they're there at the moment. Um, you know, uh, I think it will be good. Uh, I'm actually bringing the coaches together next next week. Uh, that's the first time where we're doing a bit of an Olympic review and then start talking about you know, sharing ideas. But uh, I think that's 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 number one, bringing mm. the people together. Um, then seeing where programs and everything can be upgraded. Um, you know, we, we, we will have some meets like European short courses coming up. Uh, won't be a big team from France going there. You know, it's like a very busy program already with ISL and World Cup. So there will be quite a few people opting out of that one probably opting out of um, uh, world short course as well. But it gives me a good opportunity to actually see where the country, where the team is, and then build from there. You know, I um, and hopefully build on the experience I, I had with with uh, with Australia, because this is for me like I, I have a much better, better understanding of which well, strings to pull or, or what to do than I had coming in 2014 in Australia. So that's the advantage, I think, again, of, of, of that experience. But I yeah. think it's a fair assessment to say they're approximately where Australia was six, seven years ago. We're all humans, but culturally we're, we're different. So you're walking into Australia, an Australian culture, you're walking into a French culture, um, where where are the similarities between the two i guess it's just communication it sounds like but the where where are the challenges of the two like how do you figure out okay i can get the best out of australia this way and get the best out of the, the french this way um yeah honestly for, for france it's difficult to say for me but I, but i do believe um first of all it's it's 
you know, I work for the Federation as I did in, in Australia. And it's always the Federation who calls you and says, do you want to take this job? And the Federation already has an opinion about how things are going in swimming, how the coaches operate, how this is done and, and not happy with this or very happy with that. And I think always like I have to hear and find out myself. So this is why I'm first starting to listen now to the coaches and actually want to hear what they think uh, is, is, is needed. I think what is very good at the moment in France, there is an appetite for change because obviously they're coming not of a of an incredible successful um, uh, Olympics. Um, uh, and well, that that is a good you know, start to right. say, hey, we, 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 we got to we got to do something different. We got to mm -hmm. we got to change something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that, that's where it's at now. But but to say exactly it needs this. Um, what I do want to do from the start is provide clarity. So mm. provide clarity in planning and, and qualification. You know, what do you need to go to next year's world championships and what do you need to do, go to the next year's European championships? Because I think from there, people can start building their plans and we'll communicate then and we'll start talking about their plans. And, you know, uh, then I'm sometimes the sounding board. Uh, there are some very good and experienced coaches as well. You know, they, they, they definitely don't need my input on their plan. But I can, uh, yeah, sometimes ask some questions about it and, and or just challenge you a little bit. Say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Again, mm -hmm. that's not to change coaches who are already great, but I think every coach in the world, including myself, you benefit from just having a bit of sparring partners. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm kind of in this situation now where I'm, I'm not on the pool deck, you know, all the time oh. anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, for you, uh, I mean, you've obviously gone through that period. Like you said, you did many years on the pool deck and now you're going through this management side, which is exciting. Um, where do you feel like you're, you're best suited? I mean, obviously you're, you're great in both. Do you feel more comfortable in one or the other? Comfortable, I definitely feel more on pool deck. Right. <laughs> because... A little more control. You know, when, when I I was 14 years of age, when I started to dream about becoming a coach, and so I've lived that dream up until 2012. And then I thought myself, I need to challenge myself uh, because it's not always about being happy and comfortable. Um, so going to another country, uh, because sometimes I think as well, what, what, what am I thinking? You know, <laughs> you're going three years ahead of, of um, uh, the Paris Olympics. You're going to France. Uh, and... But I, I, at the same time, I think it is that challenge um, that I need. And also with a different country where I don't really speak the language, uh, where I truly rely on other people for, for me to translate some things. And then I think, yeah, you know, um, not any of these challenges is, is, is ever easy. But it's probably what I'm looking for. It was what I what I was looking for as a coach, and it's what I'm looking for in these roles as well. And at the same time, the rewards as a coach are pretty obvious. You know, when you're an on deck coach, you see your athlete win or lose, and when they lose, it hurts you as much as they do, I think. And when they win, you're as happy, or probably even more happy than the athlete themselves. You know, you go with their energy and their emotions. And in, in, this, in this role, um, that, you know, reward system isn't, isn't that obvious. Uh, but the challenges are, are different. Working with, with, with others, uh, sometimes just going to a program, seeing a coach operate and think as a coach, like, I would do this, I would do that, and then sharing that. But also trying to let it go and say like listen you, you you do what you do with it if you don't do anything with it you know you're the coach you make the decisions here seeking that balance um truly develops you or me as a person as well and and i think that's the reward in this role is the um, 
the consistently grow uh, the, the growing you need to do yourself to 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 be able to add anything to anyone yeah well said um i'm obviously you got one of the best sprint minds in history so i'm going to ask you a couple of sprinting questions where where are we at with human capacity with with uh, how far we can go how fast we can swim uh, i mean are we pushing up on that uh, where should we continue to dream that we can get faster and faster i mean the the men's world records have, have been stuck on this this suit era for a little bit but we're getting closer to it the women's world records have um you know been taken down recently so we, we're getting faster but how do we get faster do you think um well i i think you know the funny the funny thing you see in swimming and pretty much in any sport is that it needs somebody who breaks a barrier like adam pd did with breaststroke mm. unbelievable time but now slowly but surely you see people getting to there that is not just because they train better, sleep better, recover better, have better material. Uh, obviously, technology sometimes plays a role. You know, having uh, a, a kicker on the starting block, mm -hmm. you know, uh, makes you faster in the start. You know, mm -hmm. faster than let's say 20 years ago. Uh, in in on on most occasions, having a backstroke wedge uh, mm -hmm. instead of just uh, you know something to push off in 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 backstroke obviously helps and 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 also uh, increases the level uh, maybe the technology in pools or the swimsuits or, or those kind of things have a little impact but i think the most impact is made with the belief that people can do it mm. and to believe people can do it you need um, somebody who does that like for example adam pd or maybe even like 20 years ago peter you know to break a 48 seconds and then it won't take very long before other people follow. Um, and for to swim really faster than we do right now, uh, I think I, I'd like to think outside the box in these things. Like um, we should wonder at some stage, is freestyle still the fastest way to go through the water? Mm. Uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, and I'd like to think, yes, at the moment, yes, that's what we believe and that's what we think. But I think in some way, if you see Adam Peaty swim breaststroke, you can actually say he reinvented the stroke. He's right. swimming a different rhythm, different, mm -hmm. you know, still maintaining stroke length, but on a much higher uh, rate. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so it's a combination of, of, of those elements. Uh, I can see that happen in, in, in swimming as well. But maybe even we, we should think even a little bit further and think like, you know, um, in, in, in high jumping at some stage, you, you had the Fosbury flop, you know, mm -hmm. everybody was going over their belly over, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, over the distance. And then suddenly some lunatic comes up and says like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going backward over that jumps highest wins. And then everyone takes it on board. And I think in swimming, we're, we're waiting again for the next move. Um, just like what we saw in swimming with the underwater work. Um, to, to me, it has always been a surprise and, and I was there and I was pretty much sleeping as well, but in the nineties, you had Selkov, Pankratov, you know, these guys who swam almost 50 meters on the water, which is not allowed anymore now, but they actually almost, well, 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago, already showed that underwater, you can go faster than at the surface. Still, it took us about 20 years uh, to, to actually make that mainstream. So I think sometimes we're adapting very slow in sports or actually almost decline to believe that something else can be better or um, uh, to do. So it's difficult to say where swimming goes, but that, that it will keep continue to go faster and faster. Uh, that's a hundred percent for sure. Uh, I think in our lifetime, uh, we're going to see 19 seconds in 50 freestyle. We're going to see 44, at least in hundred freestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I would say why not, but it, it requires something else than what we're doing now. Absolutely. I couldn't agree any more than with what you just said. I have, I've had many, um, walks, 
uh, with my dog. I've had me sleepless nights. I've had many times on the pool deck where I'm, where I'm thinking very similar thoughts. Like there's got to be more. Where is it? What am I missing? You know, how, how can we do it differently? Uh, and, and as you were speaking there, I was thinking to myself, well, he thinks the same way I do. Have you ever thought about locking a few of us in a room like this, you know, and just saying, hey, we're not coming out of this room until we figure this out. You know, yeah, like, yeah. We got, we're going to yeah. spend a week here. People are going to deliver food to us. And in a week, we're going to have an answer. Yeah, but uh, I would love to do that. But we need then more than swim coaches. Right. Because it, it is that, you know, this is, uh, I'm, I, I've been doing in my year off, let's say in between uh, uh, Australia and what I'm doing now. I've been quite a lot in touch also corporate. You know, you do sometimes mm. do clinics or speeches mm -hmm. or things like that. But you also learn a lot from them. And what you see with the with the tech companies, if they if they're trying to create a new reality or, mm -hmm. or trying to create, they bring people from outside. You know, for example, me from sports, mm -hmm. who has no clue what they are talking about, but you can ask the stupid questions mm -hmm. uh, and 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 raise the, the like. Have you thought of this, or is this maybe too much uh, out of the box? So, I think to get there, you need swim coaches, hundred percent. But you also need some other people who are not bothered by what we think we know in swimming. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's a great idea, actually. Uh, let's do it. Uh, you, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. in. I'm in. You know, when you decide to put it together with the best in France and the best in the Netherlands and maybe some Australians, I'm coming. Okay, so let me let me in on well, that. Well, you you have the platform now, Brett. You're I the do. man. I do. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I, honestly, I'm I'm asking as many questions as I can of people like you to try and pull out some of these answers, and maybe we can we can put it all together. But it, but even in terms of the platform, yeah, I can I can bring us together as well. So um, I know you'll be willing for that for sure. Uh, I had something else I was going to ask you before. I, <laughs> just this this conversation has has gone really well. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for this. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, what, what else then? So like, where, where are you, uh, what, what are you excited about in the future then other than just, uh, the, the opportunity with France, what's coming up in your life? Hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it also, it pretty much comes with age as well. You know, like what, what, what I described in my coaching career, I think the first 20 years in your, or the 10 years in your coaching career, you're very focused and you want to make a point and you want to coach you know uh mm -hmm. preferably an olympic champion but mm -hmm. who can tell if that's ever going to happen mm -hmm. but then through let's say these performances you get exposed i get a lot of exposure like i said to people in corporate people in business people from other worlds than just sports mm. um uh, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very much focused on France right now. You know, that's a big job. And I, I really hope um, uh, I'm not expecting a miracle there. Uh, but I definitely want uh, to do better uh, with them. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's the first thing I'm really excited for. And, and, and also to get that to know, you know, really that culture, the people uh, and, and really trying to establish, establish something, you know, leave, leave a footprint. You know, right, yeah, or, well, or at least a fingerprint. Let's well, you did that. a fantastic job in Australia. And as I was researching uh, this today, I actually came across some talks that you had given for Asker and some other places, some some technical talks. Yeah. There was one on um, anaerobic and aerobic capacity. So if anyone's watching this and they want to get more into kind of your head and the science of it, maybe there was a lot of sets that you presented. A lot of people love swim sets. There was a lot of speed sets, aerobic capacity sets. So um, that can all be found on the internet quite easily. Uh, I didn't really want to dig into that because it's already out there. So, um, again, uh, just appreciate getting to know you even more. I got, uh, an immense amount of respect for, for you and, and, and even the progression you've taken with your career. Um, um, you know, I, I think you're a, you're a pioneer. So thank you for doing this, Chaka. Well, not a problem, not a problem. So, uh, no, much, much appreciated. And I'm, I'm enjoying it. You know, you're talking about presentations. We did actually, uh, I got invited by Fred for GNU to do mm -hmm. a presentation. We did it yesterday for Colombia. Right. Uh, and also there, you know, you, I must say, you know, everywhere you meet coaches, because swimming is even much bigger than we think or know, you know, like there are mm -hmm. so many passionate coaches mm -hmm. out there with 
who probably aren't as fortunate as I was here in Eindhoven, you know, to, mm -hmm. to ultimately get a great pool and tech and staff and everything. Um, but still to work, to be able to present to those people and, and, and talk with them about what they can do in their situation or maybe ignite that small flame. I, I think, you know, that's what you're doing with your podcast as well. It's just getting some different views, some different opinions. Um, uh, you know, no, nobody has the full answer or mm -hmm. the, the whole truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't want to, you know, it's, it's, it's about sharing and, and, and doing this. So, yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I hope I can continue to do that for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, love watching what you're doing. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate you sharing and uh, good luck with the, the, the gig in France. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Thank All right. you. All right. All right. Take care. You. All right. Bye-bye.